Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. We got some big news. Uh, this is the fourth to the last show of the Tony Hernandez Show. I got some uh, life changes and some other things going on behind the scenes. Uh, but I want to just thank SCC Television, SPNN for broadcasting, and most of all, I want to thank you, uh, the audience, for tuning in, for watching. Uh, whether you're watching on TV or YouTube, certainly appreciate you viewing this. Uh, the show is going to continue. It's going to be reformatted. Uh, Dallas is still going to be the producer, and uh, we're going to have uh, a, a new host, Mr. Jeffrey Williams. He's going to be on. He's also here with us today. Uh, but what a beautiful day it is outside, isn't it? It's mid-October, 60 degrees, sunny. It doesn't get any better than this. This means two things. First one is time to get the outside work done. I spent all day up on a ladder today painting. If you see on my fingernails, there's a little bit of uh, paint here and maybe on my hands. I didn't quite have the time to, to wash them, but just be forewarned, get out there, rake those leaves, paint the house, clean the garage, because old man winter is right around the corner. And uh, being mid-October, what we also know, as you'll see, uh, driving around all the campaign signs or tuning in to your TV and watching the political ads. We're in prime time campaign season. November 4th is election day. Make sure you get out there and do your civic duty. Register to vote. Encourage your friends to become educated. Find out who's running for your state house seat. If there's a city council race, find out who the city council candidates are in your city. Um, all the federal uh, U.S. House of Representative seats are up. Find out who's running. Don't just look at Democrat or Republican. You know, if you've been voting Democrat your entire life, look at the issues. A lot of people out there are noticing that things aren't getting better. We're in the slowest recovery uh, that we've ever had from a recession. Um, jobs are still scarce. Incomes are, are stagnant. And a lot of people are hurting. So we need new leadership. We need new vision. Uh, the Democrats aren't the answer for everything. Neither are the Republicans. Look at other uh, parties as well, Green Party, Independence Party. Uh, but with that, I want to bring on our guests. Uh, first of all, Mr. Jeffrey Wilson, or Williams, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Thank this you, is your Tony. first time being here. Uh, it's my first time being here on your show, but not my first time uh, being actually at this studio, not my first time being on camera. Well, so congratulations. I guess our handshake is kind of a informal passing of the baton. A little bit here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we stated, the show is going to be reformatted. We only have four shows left. The uh, last show, Tony Hernandez show, will be the Saturday after Election Day. And uh, to my left here, you guys probably recognize she was on the show uh, back in March. This is Lena Bugs. She's a Minnesota State House of Representatives candidate. And Lena, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be on again. It's uh, pretty awesome having you here again. Back in March, you were just uh, starting out your campaign. Uh, tell us, how have things been going? Well, as you indicated, I just was uh, announcing my candidacy. Mm -hmm. um, I went through the process of I'm running as a Green Party candidate, so I have to have ballot access. And uh, for those of you at home, ballot access um, for the Green Party means that we had to have at least 500 signatures in order for me to, to be on the November ballot. My campaign uh, went out, we door knocked, we talked to people uh, in the district. Uh, we were able to gain 870 signatures. And uh, yeah, Not and we were, we were uh, granted ballot access. So I'm going to be on the uh, November 4th ballot in my district. And uh, I think that people, uh, my message will resonate and people will vote for me. And, and where exactly is your district? You're in 65A? Yes, in St. Paul 65A. And, and that's, that's what geographical, well, what neighborhoods? Yes, uh, as you know, St. Paul is a town and neighborhood, so uh, that includes the Frogtown neighborhood, the north portions of the North End neighborhood, the Snelling Hamlins, uh, Lexington Hamlin neighborhood. So in other words, Hamlin. Midway. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it, it's a big district. It encompasses a lot, and it's a diverse uh, group of residents that live in my district. Well, i got to say, uh, we're Facebook friends, and I've been following your campaign via Facebook. It looks like you've really been getting your name out there. Uh, you are constantly going to different neighborhood events, community events. Uh, looks like you're doing a ton of door knocking. 
Um, are you exhausted yet, or, or how are you feeling energy-wise? Well, you know, I am. I'm pretty exhausted, but you know, um, I just continue to work. Uh, I want the residents in my district to know that they are going to have a representative who is uh, of the people and who's going to work hard. And I think that's something that's missing at the state legislature. Well, I got to say, I first met Lena when I was running for the United States Congress, and this was uh, about two years ago to, to around this date. And we went to, uh, is it the Morning Star Baptist Church in St. Paul on yes. Shelby Avenue? Yes. And uh, Lena and I took part in a debate on uh, voter ID at that time. Uh, Lena was in support or I'm sorry, it was against uh, the constitutional amendment uh, for voter ID, and I was uh, in favor for it. And I really gained uh, my respect uh, for Lena meeting you that day because we had uh, a very fiery and fun debate where uh, I, I believe everyone who was there uh, got a lot out of it. They got to hear two sides of the issue. Uh, we didn't resort to name calling or any disrespectful stuff no. like that. We just talked about the facts. And, uh, you know, I appreciated hearing uh, your perspective. And, um, you know, I believe that I, I learned a lot from that. And I, commend you as well for uh, running on a, a third party ticket with the Green Party. Uh, you know, as I stated in the opening, so many people think along the lines of a Democrat versus Republican, like there's only uh, two ideas or two differing viewpoints out there. Whereas, uh, I, you know, I really believe we need more and more people such as yourself with the courage to step up to run against the machine. Because if you're in the urban core, uh, the the DFL, the, the big labor union, uh, the, the crony capitalist machine is a very strong uh, machine. Can you just talk a little bit about how uh, it is running uh, against, um, you know, such a, such a, um, you know, machine such as that? Well, it is, it's difficult. I come from an activist background, as you know, and uh, I really appreciated you coming down to the church and having the <laughs> forum. I, um, I gained a, a respect for you as well, um, coming with kind of a libertarian viewpoint and a more conservative uh, viewpoint. But as you uh, indicated, um, you know, we, uh, we didn't agree and, and uh, voter ID, um, that got shot down. But, it um, did. <laughs> however, though, what it did was it, um, it transitioned me to be able to work across party lines. And in fact, I remember having a conversation with you saying, let's work together if you got in. So, and that's kind of the attitude that I'm taking along with my campaign. I'm neither Democrat, I'm neither Republic, Republican. Um, I just work solely on behalf of poor and working families and working families in general. And I think this message of mine, um, working across party lines and getting big money out of politics is resonating um, across party lines. This uh, democratic machine, however, has been in place so long. Um, they had a super majority and, uh, you know, there was a lot of legislation that got missed this past legislative session. You know, one of the things that really gets to me is if you watch like a political ad or if you listen to a, a, a Democrat politician you know they'll talk about compassion they'll talk about mm -hmm. working for the poor um, they'll talk about their policies they'll talk about saving Social Security but nothing ever mm -hmm. seems to get fixed yeah and so and my question is especially here in Minnesota in, in, in the urban areas we, there's Democrats across the board whether it's City Council yes. the State House the State Senate they have all the seats and they have had them for the last 30 to 40 years now, at the same time, while they're telling us that they're helping the poor and they're helping, um, you know, people of color, Minnesota ranks at the very bottom in terms of the achievement gap, where uh, African American students, uh, Hispanic American students, and, and some Asian American students um, are graduating at far lower rates than their white counterparts, and they also uh, test worse when it comes to mathematics and. Um, um, in other subjects and so my question is when you're going door to door in your district which is a heavily democratic district do people understand this or do they buy into the idea that um, the Democrats are, are working for them well, you know, when I go door to door and I explain the disparities um, it's making people take a, a second look at what democratic or what I like to call pretend progressive policies in Minnesota um, what has that gained? What have we gained from that? As you indicated, we have some of the worst disparities in education and employment. Um, and it's making people take a second look at that. What I'm hearing is that, you know, 
um, it's that DFL machine again. You know, Lena, we would like to vote for you. Some of some of the Democrats are going to, to vote for me, um, as well as some of the uh, Republicans are going to vote for me. But there's this consensus that things aren't getting better under Democratic one-party rule. Now, I do have one question uh, regarding the uh, black community, African American community. Why is it that they tend to vote Democrat so much and not open up their minds to Green Party or Libertarian or even Republican viewpoints? Well, I think that that's, um, that's changing, um, certainly with my race, but I think mm -hmm. that that uh, mentality is changing a lot. I think that um, the Democrats have um, have sold the, um, and I don't think it's specific to African American community, I think it's to all people mm -hmm. that they are the party of Democratic farm and labor. However, their rhetoric doesn't line up with their policy making. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the uh, big issues that we talked about when you came in uh, in March was of a living wage, minimum wage, there was a debate going on at that time, no laws had been passed, and sure. since then, uh, I believe the minimum wage has been, was it, correct me if I'm wrong, but gradually it's going to increase to 950 in this state, 950 per hour? Yes. Um in 2016, it will uh, it will raise to uh, 950. However, um, in August, it raised to eight dollars per hour okay. for large employers. Uh -huh. For small employers, it's 650. Mm -hmm. And so, are you happy with uh, this law as it was passed? Um, you know, you were you're a proponent of of the living wage. Do you think that the Democrats delivered in this instance? I don't. I think that they failed the residents of uh, of Minnesota and our great state miserably. I think that in acting a poverty poverty wage such as 950 it still leaves people 40 percent below the poverty so again they, these are the types of pretend progressive policies that they tout as being progressive they're regressive because they don't get families on an upward trajectory out of poverty we want to bring people from poverty to prosperity mm -hmm. well uh, how are you going to bring somebody from poverty to prosperity by increasing the minimum wage when isn't the answer fixing the economy I mean, if you increase the minimum wage, it has a, ne a regressive negative impact on businesses and on employers. And, uh, you know, it just goes with, um, you know, the cost of uh, consumer goods and services. So isn't, you know, fixing the economy more of an answer than just raising the minimum wage? Well, you have to fix the economy. Um, I disagree with um, your statement, but you have to fix the economy, but you also have to raise wages. I mean, people cannot continue to work part-time jobs, two and three part-time jobs to feed their families. You know, you have to, you have to stop deficit spending in times of prosperity. Mm. Now that we'll agree on. But I, I think that people have the right, especially when you have CEOs who are earning $10,000 per hour. We're, talking, we're not talking about small businesses. We are talking about corporations who are, whose earnings are in the billions of dollars. They can afford to pay people cost of living wages, not minimum wages. That way, people have more money to spend in the economy. That way, people can sustain their families. That way, you don't have to have systems such as welfare. And you can use th that portion of tax dollars to create economic development. So what do you propose then? If, if you don't think that that went far enough, what do you propose for minimum wage or well, living let's, wage? Let's, um, I don't like the term minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Let's. I call it cost of living wages. Oh, is that just but arguing propose, semantics? No, it isn't semantics. Uh, minimum wage suggests just that, the bare minimum to get by. Cost of living wages is what's going to sustain people and keep people being productive citizens, having uh, the morale to be able to go to work to know that, you know what, I may not be able to get rich, which I don't think middle class America is looking to get rich. We're just looking to put gas in our car, food in the tables, pay the mortgage. And for those who, you know, aren't uh, quite there yet and are living in poverty, I think that, um, you know, that will raise uh, their morale as well, too. So I don't think it's a question of semantics. I think it's just good public policy. So now let's take a look at, you know, Governor Dayton and, you know, in the DFL majority, you know, all of the taxes and fees that they've increased and the price of just doing business. You know, business licenses in Minnesota are just outrageous in comparison to some of the other states like Iowa and Wisconsin. They're right on our borders. And, you know, as a legislator, what would you do to help fix that and help get more economic growth inside your district? 
Well, I think what happens is um, with in my district, it's kind of a, a, a poor district. So I think what has to happen is we have to have um, governmental subsidies for small businesses. And I also think that with the supermajority, um, the reason that we maintain this uh, billion dollar surplus, if you will, is because there was a business to business tax that uh, that was repealed. They knew they were going to have to go out and they were going to have to campaign. So I just think that it's, you know, the DFL has this false sense of security, um, you know, that they, um, the message, their messaging that they put out, you know, we're the lesser of two evils. And I think that uh, voters are sick and tired of hearing that mentality. I think that um, there used to be a time where there wasn't, you know, a D after someone's name or an mm -hmm. R or an I. It was voting for the best candidate, voting for the best legislation that was going to help families. So I think we need to get back to that. Well, going back to the minimum wage, what do you think about the uh, gentleman, he was a restaurant owner in Stillwater, was it, where he put on the actual receipt that there was a, a t an additional cents. surcharge that he was making mm -hmm. because of the minimum wage increase? I wanted to ask your opinion about, about that. And then my second part of the question is, um, you know, is the uh, is the stigma surrounding that is it justified or is it not? Well, um, and there's a lot going on in that question, so I'll answer it as best as mm -hmm. I can. But um, to speak to the first part of that question, um, I saw that in the news as well too. Um, and we're talking about he was a small business owner. We weren't talking mm -hmm. about you know uh, corporations. Right. So there's let's make that distinction. Okay. I'm a big proponent of small businesses. I think that um, we should be doing more in our state to cut taxes for small businesses. I think small businesses, they pay a higher tax rate than the corporations do. Uh, I think that there needs to be some legislation. Because of the, the different tax breaks that Exa some of the larger corporations are able to take advantage of? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And I think there has to be some legislation to help small businesses because when I'm talking to small businesses, they say, well, Lena, we'd love to pay cost of living wages, but we simply can't afford to. So I think that they should be able to qualify for some subsidies to help pay for their labor costs. Mm -hmm. um, now, with, re, um, with respect to corporations, it's important that we keep businesses here, but doing business in the great state of Minnesota is a privilege. It isn't a right. And what I tell people is that we should be paying cost of living wages, especially if your profits are in the tens of millions or billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You should be He's touting these uh, job numbers. He's saying that, you know what, we have one of the lowest unemployment rates when in fact, you know, we've got people who are working part-time jobs or people mm -hmm. in jobs that they don't want to be in yeah. or that they're overqualified for. And instead of spending money on a $77 million Senate building, we can put that into economic development. See, now that's where we're in agreement, is the allocation of, of funds from the legislature and, you know, the priorities of the governor and how they uh, impact, you know, the, you know, the cities. I don't think, per se, that increasing the minimum wage is going to help that, but reallocating from a 77 or 90 million dollar Senate office building into investment into the cities I think would actually be more beneficial than what you have with you know increasing the minimum wage. Well that's where we we disagree. I think that increasing the minimum wage is going to be good for families because then they don't have to make those critical choices between shelter and food. And in my district, that's those are the tough decisions that are being uh, raised right now. I mean, I also think that, um, you know, instead of spending $950 million on a train that goes from uh, St. Paul to Minneapolis and back, um, I think that, you know, we should have made investments in fixing the roads. Now, I find it ironic now that we're in an election year that now the roads are starting to be mm -hmm. repaired. Um, but I have, I have spoken out against uh, repairing the roads and the bridges. Um, we had an excellent uh, transportation system before we had commuter rail and light rail. And I think that making investments in transportation, we could have, um, you know, you have to uh, perform what we call fiduciary responsibility. That's right. Um, you know, when I'm given a budget for my household, I can't deficit spend even though I may be prosperous. So if I'm given a household budget, I have to work within my means. And I think right now that the reallocation of funds and the way that the spending is happening right now, I don't think that it benefits people. Yeah, and you know, I was going to say too, just to, to interject, and we got to move on to another top, to, uh, two other topics, but that um, you know, 
the w the minimum wage doesn't necessarily drive inflation. You know, although if minimum wage goes up for some businesses, they may have to pass that cost on to their customers. However, it, it's not the driver of inflation. I think you hit on what the driver of inflation is by talking about deficit spending, mm -hmm. and it starts in Washington, D.C. Right. We haven't had a balanced budget since 1999 or the year 2000. The last time that the national debt went down year over year was 1960, the last year of the Eisenhower, <laughs> excuse me. Well, what about the last time the, uh, the, the, the budget was balanced the last under time Clinton, the, correct? But, but the national debt still went up because interest payments on the national debt are off balance. Yep. And oh, now, like currently, I think it's 42 to 44 cents out of every dollar the federal mm -hmm. government spends is borrowed printed money. And that increase of the national debt and the increase of the monetary supply and the quantitative easing and the stimulus and everything that's gone on uh, really since uh, President Bush took office uh, post 9-11, um, we've seen the spike of, you can look at tuition rates. Yes. If you go to any college and you look at their historical tuition from 1999 to current, you'll see the, the Al, Gore, Al Gore hockey, uh, hockey stick yeah. curve. Well, um, I can remember my college tuition uh, roughly uh, back in uh, 1992. Uh, my college education cost me right around $55,000. Yep. I went to a private school, went to St. Thomas uh, in St. Paul. How and, much did uh, it cost? $5,500? $55,000. Uh -huh. uh, and this was in 1992. Okay. I have uh, two daughters who are Hamlin uh, graduates. $100,000. Unbelievable. Um, and it's going to take them their lifetime in order to pay off that debt. Yeah, and somebody said, I don't know if it's in one of the governor's debates, but somebody brought up this idea that the idea of state schools was actually supposed to be uh, not a Ferrari type mm -hmm. education. Exactly. It was meant to be more of a community based uh, education for people who couldn't afford the exactly. enormous tuitions, but now there are enormous tuitions across the board unless you're looking at. Uh, community colleges, which I uh, I do think is a good option for a lot of people, especially the first two years. Well, of school. one other thing about uh, about the uh, public schools, and it's the hidden fee. We see the tuition. This is how much it costs. Now, when I went to the University of Minnesota, and then uh, yeah, I've been to school a few different times, and I'm currently uh, working on two graduate degrees simultaneously. You know, one's at a private school, one's at a public school. And on the public school, there is a statement that says uh, tuition covers X percent of your tuition. The rest is a subsidy. And so taxpayers are footing the bill for the public schools in addition to what the tuition rate has. And not to mm -hmm. mention they're accepting more and more kids from out of state they, and out yes. of the country too, which I think is a shame. We need to serve our, our kids here in Minnesota. But going back, I want to ask you some questions. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but sure. I, you know, just so everyone can know, if you're elected, what are you going to do when you're elected? You know, to kind of get an idea as to how you would vote. I'm just going to ask sure. you about a few issues. I uh, just want you to, to quickly explain how you would vote. Some of them are from the past. Uh, first one I'll start with is uh, the Viking Stadium. Would you have put up um, taxpayer funds to fund uh, Ziggy Wolf's ta uh, stadium in Minneapolis? Would you have voted to support that, or would you have voted against it? I would have voted against that. I'm against uh, giving corporate welfare to uh, millionaires and billionaires, so I would have voted against that. Um, those positions. Um, in the souvenir shops and likely the people in my district would have held those positions and they would have been uh, poverty wages so I would have voted against that. Okay. And then another big one was, and I know uh, your opponent, uh, Rena Moran, Representative Moran, she um, struggled with this vote. She ultimately voted in support of the anti-bullying legislation from uh, the last session. She said she had hesitations about it because she thought that this law, because it was so open-ended, could potentially harm uh, students of color from discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, how would you have voted on the anti-bullying legislation as it was passed, yes or no? Well, you know, it didn't go far enough, in, in my opinion, to protect um, not only just students in general, but I think um, uh, students that struggled with uh, gender identity issues. So um, I know she voted yes, um, it, I would have voted no. Mm -hmm. And then what about um, the uh, 
the variety of taxes that took place, the warehouse tax that the Democrats passed, would you have voted for the, Demo for the warehouse tax? I wouldn't have. I mean, the reason that there was this billion dollar surplus is due to those types of taxes, the business to business taxes. They knew, um, I'm sorry, they being the Democrats knew that they were going to have to go door to door and explain to people, mm -hmm. um, you know, why these taxes were enacted. So I, I wouldn't have been in support of that. See, I was just shocked when uh, they started <laughs> to tout, you know, you saw Governor Dayton almost brag about mm -hmm. tax reductions exactly. and cutting taxes, about the taxes that they that, raised. It's, uh, I couldn't believe it. And this is what I mean by pretend progressive policies. You know, where on the surface they may seem as though they're progressive, um, and actually, you know, they're used. You know, I call it political posturing, um, <laughs> but they're actually regressive because you know we don't want to drive businesses out. However, though, we do want businesses to pay cost of living wages. Mm -hmm. I think that um, in reference to taxes, I think we need to talk about uh, tax relief for small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, they should be able to, uh, to qualify for subsidies so that they are able to pay cost of living wages. And there's a, a few ways that, uh, that we can do that, too. And, and uh, you know, the thing about running for the House seat is, um, in our state, we currently have 134 representatives. Mm -hmm. One party does not have the answer. So you have to be able to work across party lines, um, I, you know, Arnie Carlson did that when he was governor, you know, but this, uh, this Dayton administration um, hasn't done that. I'm willing to do that. And not only just for residents in my district, but for the great state of Minnesota. I think that um, another issue that's been brought up um, as well, too, is the sulfide mining issue up in the Boundary Waters area, too. And we can have green jobs. It doesn't have to be jobs or the environment. We can have both. And, uh, and there's a way to do that. But I think getting input from all sides would really serve the residents and the people of our great state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And could I think you, it's time. Could you give us just an example of a situation that you've been in where you have worked across party lines and, and put together a coalition of sorts for whatever endeavor you were involved with? OK, sure. Um, this is a very uh, sensitive issue. Um, I am a member of the Welfare Rights Committee. And so we advocate on behalf of, of poor and working families and uh, welfare benefits. And uh, the, um, the Republican stance on that is, um, you know, it's very conservative. And uh, so we put together a, uh, a task force because we found out through our research that of the block grants that were given to the state of Minnesota for welfare, only 28% of that grant was actually going towards families. So we had to work across party lines to enact legislation to uh, raise the welfare grants. Now, the welfare grants haven't been raised in 28 years, but you know, if you aren't creating jobs, then you have to sustain those safety net programs. Uh, that legislation didn't get passed. However, what came out of it was a task force that was created now. So they're looking into it, both sides, both Republicans and Democrats are looking into it to find out where has that money gone. 73% of the block grants haven't been allocated. Wow. I mean, that's a travesty. You talk about waste. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So what about, uh, the, you know, one thing that made the news recently was the Community Action Network. Is that the name of it? Yes. Um, so they came out that they were using, I, I can't remember the final figure, but hundreds of thousands of dollars towards lavish trips, celebrity cruises. Staff uh, salaries. You know, and other, and other items like that, that, you know, turned out to be, you know, there's a probe going into it and, sure. and looking further. People are calling for uh, perhaps even criminal prosecutions. Like, what is your stance on that in terms of, if you're a representative, um, do you feel like you have, have that need to go in there to protect the taxpayer money? Definitely, I have an obligation, not a need. I have an obligation to protect taxpayer dollars. I think that there has to be politician accountability. And I mean, those actions were, let's call it what it is, those actions were criminal. Mm. I mean, those dollars were supposed to support poor and working families and uh, financial assistance and energy assistance. I mean, we all know that Minnesota Minnesota isn't the place <laughs> that you want to be in, um, you know, when the weather gets cold. But I mean, you know, uh, you're talking about nonprofit uh, salaries in, es in um, essence of $275,000 uh, nonprofit salaries. Um, you know, uh, you're um, pocketing money off the backs of poor and working families. It's deplorable, to say the least.
So what would you do just to continue an investigation, continue the probe into it and, well, I think and get all the facts you can? I think what's happening is um, I believe that uh, facts are being gathered right now. Um, definitely would call for, you know, a, a look uh, inquiry by the ethics department. Definitely have to do that. And then um, once the facts are, are made, I think the hearings, though, should be made public. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if they're being made public so that the taxpayers can come in and the people who have been affected by this misappropriation of funds would be able to uh, to voice their displeasure. Uh, Leah, I wanted to bring some other topics up here. We had uh, gotten into, uh, we like to get into a few debates here and there on yeah. Facebook, and they're all uh, very positive, which is something I've always um, really respected about you is that, okay, we may have a little bit of difference in viewpoint, but, you know, we can talk about it and we can come to a higher understanding almost um, I remember the first one was minimum wage. We got into a nice debate yes, about that one. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's a heated Funny topic. how that works. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I learned a lot, you know, from listening to your perspective. And, you know, I'm not always, I'm not 100% right. And if anyone thinks that they are 100% right. Indeed. They're for sure wrong about one thing. But. Uh, no, Lena's 100% right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other, the other uh, issue I wanted to talk to you about was, um, you know, some of the racial issues that are going on. I had made a Facebook post. This was probably like uh, three months ago or something. Uh, where I stated, you know, because I was hearing a lot about this idea of white privilege, and you know, just a disclaimer: I grew up. My last name's Hernandez, and and my mom's 100% Irish. My my grandpa was a part of an immigrant family, youngest of 13, immigrated from Mexico. Um, you know, I got, as you can see, light skin. Um, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, I just consider myself American. You know, is basically the bottom line. And, and growing up, I always kind of felt a little out of place, like because with uh, Hispanics and Latinos, I didn't necessarily feel like I fully fit in because of my white skin and I don't speak Spanish perfectly. And hanging out with uh, my white Euro friends, European friends, uh, I never really felt quite like I fit in there because my last name's Hernandez and you know I endured some uh, Hispanic jokes and whatnot. And usually I wouldn't get too mad, but did definitely got into a couple fights, fist fights after. And probably more just I was in a bad mood. Somebody said the wrong thing at the wrong time. And you don't strike me as a fighter. <laughs> I'm, not <laughs> usually, I'm not usually. But so that's my perspective. And, and I, what I posted on Facebook was, um, you know, something along the lines of, you know, I don't necessarily know if we have an issue of white privilege uh, in this country. Um, you know, I think really the privilege that people are born into is, is, is having a parent or parents who care about them and love them and ultimately that is the number one determiner of success and it's not race and uh it, you know i thought i was posting something you know s somewhat non-controversial and got into a huge huge debate and it was interesting to see uh the two sides kind of play it out um you know where i think i came to to a little bit of a higher understanding as a result of it all um, but we've heard a lot about white privilege in the news and the media um, you know, to me, it seems like what white privilege is is basically um, the 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 um, what's the right word? The privilege, I guess, that that people are born into that they don't even know that they have. And it would take getting outside of your body or outside of your skin and into somebody else's shoes to fully realize, you know, the privilege that it is to be born a certain color in a certain place. Is, does that sound about right, Lena? Or? Yeah, you know, I um, I actually saw your post mm -hmm. uh, when you posted it, and um, you know, so I'm glad that I'm here so that we can talk about it openly. I think with Facebook, I mean, you, you leave a lot of room, um, and I think that's a, a conversation that uh, we definitely um, have to have. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there is uh, white privilege um, coming from the perspective of me being an African-American female. I think what it's turned into now is classism, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of the issue. Um, now there is there is a privilege um, that's being there is a privilege just be, just being born white. There is that privilege. I know that um, if I were um, a Caucasian female, that I would be less likely um, to be stopped. Uh, by police. I know that I would be less likely to be watched when I go into a store, even though I'm a law-abiding citizen. But now what's happening is because there's such a gross disparity between the rich and poor, it's turned into a classism thing now. 
So the haves and the have nots are completely different. So we're seeing people being accosted strictly because of their class status, mm. um, if you will. However, um, white privilege plays out, I think, when you talk about income disparities, when you talk about employment disparities. I mean, Minnesota ranks near the bottom when it comes uh, in terms of employment yep. um, between um, its you, white you're citizens about the and employment non. employment gap, basically. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. the employment gap. So there has to be some, some sort of um, protections. Not necessarily sure about how to, um, you know, it's going to take all of us to work together to, to close that gap. And there has to be legislation to kind of level the playing field, if you will, on that. Um, it's such a um, uh, passionate discussion that has to happen that I don't know if we're ready to really have that conversation yet honestly. Mm. Well first of all speaking as the um, person on this panel who has solid uh, European based <laughs> ancestry um, I, ju I just I guess from my peers I have one question and that is um, what is your thoughts or feelings related to Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson as being leaders of the black community. You know, I've worked with people with the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder. I've worked with a lot of people inside the black community and, you know, I find great people, you know, solid professionals. You know, You're sitting next to one. I am, see? <laughs> but, you know, the, the opinion of my peers is that they see the Jesse Jacksons and the Al Sharptons as the ones who are causing the divide and that influences part of this d the debate coming from that other side. And I just want your thoughts and opinions about them as the community leaders. And then how, you know, what does it take from within the black community? Uh, not necessarily legislation, but just from within, how do you organize to, you know, try to become more inclusive or build up the communities on their own right? Well, I think there's this perception that uh, post-civil rights, that there's going to be one leader to bring us to the promised land, to lead us into the promised land. And that isn't, uh, that isn't necessarily true. I mean, there are a lot of great leaders in the African-American community that we all work together. And I'm speaking on the local front um, uh, because I can't speak really on the national front. Uh, I'm a local um, citizen representative. I don't use politician because it has a corporate connotation. but. Um, you know, locally here, there are a lot of leaders who are doing um, a lot of great things um, to promote community. Now, I also think that it's, it isn't just a um, African-American issue, it's a people issue, so it isn't gonna mm -hmm. just take African-Americans, it's going to take Caucasians and Latinos, it's going to take everybody to kind of level the playing field. You know, one thing I, I found pretty interesting is, and, and I want to get hear your take on this too, is um, I heard from that debate that we had on Facebook, uh, people said, and you mentioned it, that you don't understand what it's like to be targeted by the police or to be brutalized by the police. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that when there is an atrocity committed by a policeman or woman against uh, an African American, male or female, is there more outrage sometimes from the African American community than when there's police brutality and police crimes committed against white people, Mexican Americans? Um, because to me, I see a huge problem with police brutality across this country. And um, I do think maybe more of it happens uh, towards uh, people of color for whatever reasons, probably a lot of reasons that have to do with class like you mentioned. Um, if you're living in the, su su the suburbs, it's different if you're living, uh, you know, in the inner city in terms of even, you know, uh, somebody brought the example up of selling drugs illegally. Inner city youth tend to sell drugs, and I'm generalizing here, but on the streets, whereas suburban youth tend to sell drugs in their cars or um, in people's houses, less visible, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but do you, think there is a, do you think there's a problem with police brutality across the board, or do you think that police uh, brutality has their focus primarily against people of color? 
Well, it's an issue across the board. I mean, we've seen um, recently in the headlines that there's been numerous cases of abuses of power by the police, and it's an issue across the board. Um, it's more prevalent in the African American uh, communities just because there's always been um, that that fear or um, that intimidation. Um, the police aren't trusted, and I think there's a, a reason behind that. I think that, um, you know, I'm a child of the 70s, uh, grew up in the 80s, and uh, I remember when uh, police used to walk the beats, they were a part of the community, and mm. now it's just seen as they're not there to protect and serve, they're there to harass and terrorize. Um, I don't see policemen out engaging in the community, and when you bring up police brutality and when the African-American community is being brutalized as often as it has, you know, those those questions come about. But uh, the African-American community and communities at large are, um, you know, they're pretty angry about mm -hmm. police brutality. And, and I will go on record saying that, uh, you know, if I'm elected, that I will enact a legislation that will require uh, police officers to carry insurance when they brutalize members of the community. You know, we got to bring on our next guest, but I wanted to ask you one last question, and, and thank you so much for coming on the show, Lena. I certainly uh, appreciate it. It's great seeing you It's always you again. great I, being I wish here. You, uh, I wish you the absolute best on, on the campaign. I just wanted to leave one last thought with you. If you're elected, would you support a bill um, that for nonviolent uh, criminal offenders, people who have um, felonies, misdemeanors, you know, after a certain period of time, seven years, ten years, whatever it is, if they go without any uh, further uh, convictions and if it's a, their original offense was a nonviolent offense, would you be in support of, of uh, basically exonerating those people from having these things on their records so that they can get jobs easier? So and that, housing. And because it seems, I know people personally who have done stupid things when they are kids. Sure. Or not kids, I should say, they were adults. Young adults. Charged as adults. You know, maybe it's a marijuana infraction, or maybe it's uh, something else where there wasn't a victim of, you know, there was no physical sure. violence. Victimless crime. Mm -hmm. Victimless crime. And they're still suffering from trying to find jobs to this day. And, I, you know, I'm just wondering if, if there's anything that we can do about that. I have a man who is uh, working on my campaign who uh, was charged with a felony back in 1977. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, uh, yes, I would support legislation that would exonerate. I would get full expungements as long as it's a nonviolent crime. And I think people need to have that opportunity to restart their lives and, uh, you know, to become a productive citizen again. Okay. Well, Lena, thank you so All much right, for coming for on the show. Here. Great, great to see you. Again. Thanks, Lena. That's Lena Bergs, candidate for the Minnesota State House of Representatives. Next, we're going to be bringing on Justice Whitehorn, and uh, he's running for the State House as well. So we're going to get to uh, know him. While we bring uh, him on, I'm going to play this new Jeff Johnson uh, commercial that he recently released. It's called Unaware. I think it's a, a pretty a good. Uh, it's a pretty good ad here, and I wanted to play that as we bring our next guest on, Justice Whitehorn. Aware of bonuses for his failed Obamacare bureaucrats, not even knowing what's in the bills he signed. Half a billion taxpayer dollars to the Wilfs after they committed civil fraud and racketeering. I was not aware at all. What is Mark Dayton aware of? Minnesotans deserve an engaged governor who knows what's going on and what's in the bills he signs. I'll be a 24-7 leader who owns his decisions. The buck stops with me. Jeff Johnson for governor.